Gen Z gets dunked on on this channel often and in general, Gen Z often gets dunked on because they obviously have some problems functioning as adults in the world. And I just saw this new report that Gen Z might be the most undateable generation yet. It says, is Gen Z the most undateable generation ever? Maybe, but it's not really their fault. You know about the greatest generation, now meet the undateable generation. And they interviewed this huge uh, number of Gen Zers who are in their 20s and they're in the dating culture and the dating world about why it's so fraught with problems. Um, but essentially they concluded that they fit the stereotypes, all of the negative stereotypes about Gen Z, glued to their phones, indecisive, and hyper-focused on themselves. They're like self-aware to a point where it's self-destructive yeah. and That's cannot fathom the idea of going up and talking to her, as the meme suggests. Yeah. You know, um, even the girls, like all of them are just hyper-analyzing everything they do but not paying attention to the person in front of them. And that's a problem when all you're doing is looking inwards. It's, it's not actually the type of uh, self, it's not the type of self-assessment that actually leads to change. It's just obsessive behavior and narcissism turned inwards, which isn't helpful when you're trying to build a relationship with another person. It's kind of like, you know how they always say like, um, I watched this video the other day where this woman talks about like, uh, it was like one of those w videos where women try to make other women feel good about themselves where she's talking about going to the beach mm -hmm. and like, you don't have to look perfect. She's like, nobody's looking at you. Like everybody's too self, uh, is too self-conscious about how they look, right? So <laughs> there is, the issue is like now is like two people go and they start this clumsy courtship and they're both so worried about what they're saying that they're not even paying attention to what the other person is saying. And then it's like self-destructive from the beginning. It implodes before it yeah. can even start. Yeah, they, they noted a few key problems with Gen Z. So I guess number one would be that they're so non-committal. They're mm -hmm. afraid of commitment mm -hmm. in general. And... Um, I guess that they point to dating apps as the reason for this because dating apps and social media, they give your brain this illusion of Choice. constant options mm -hmm. and then they are left in a state of decision paralysis one basically. of the things that i've been talking about a lot lately is the the number one thing and this has been going on in television and movies for decades too is this idea that there's this poisonous notion that there's always just something a little bit better and that right. you're always going to find somebody a little bit better than what you've got nobody's willing to accept that it's not about whether what you have could be something better it's about learning to appreciate what you have for what it is and not needing something better just because it might exist. Mm -hmm. People are very afraid of mediocrity yeah. and just being okay. But oh, most of the happiest people would probably be considered, you know, mid range in salary and perhaps mid range in looks. And I, I just, I, I think it's interesting that you say about that about non committal um, because I think our generation is being forced into being non-committal in a lot of ways where we don't have a lot of the same opportunities that previous generations mm. had whether that's in the job market whether that's housing you know most of us are probably not going to be able to afford homes um so yeah. it's hard it's hard wired now into us or i guess it's it's we're being trained to not be commit uh, committal. Yeah, hey, would they... you like to get together and not own a home together? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like why get married if you don't have the ability to build a life together, practically speaking. And they interviewed some Gen Z men, uh, all of whom said that they are delaying getting married, even the ones who are in relationships, because they are waiting for this arbitrary point of financial stability that seems not attainable don't, for them. Don't wait, just do it. <laughs> a lot of them are obsessed with the idea of being ready to get married. And these guys who are mainly in their early 20s or like mid 20s are saying, yeah, I'm not at that point yet. I'm not making enough money yet. I don't feel like I have enough to offer as a marriage prospect. The guys were saying this because I don't have enough money. No, that's so sad. You don't have to have you don't have to have a certain sum of money to get married. You're supposed to build yourselves up together as a young married yeah. couple. Kings, kings. <sighs> the ladies are out earning us nowadays anyways. 
Make her. <laughs> well, I, it seems like a bit Make, of a cop she's out. Gonna be the, she's going to be the breadwinner anyways, guys. Uh, Shoot her shot. It, it, it seems like <laughs> it's a bit of a cop out because you can just point to this practical reason why you're afraid of commitment, well, but really it might be masking some deeper well, issues. There are very good reasons to, uh, like, the, it's very well known. Look, divorce rates, high. Um, the way income is split, uh, how it affects kids if you have kids for custody. And with all of these things being known now, there's a lot of reasons for men especially to be extremely hesitant when entering the dating market. And the question is, is you're, you as an individual have to be able to provide them a real reason, you know, not just pie in the sky, but it has to be something that seems very, very down to earth and attainable as to ignore all of those instances that offer something so negative, mm -hmm. right? And that's not easy to do. And there's a destruction of the notion of love in a lot of ways these days. People are more cynical than they've ever been. Perhaps in the past, a less cynical person can override their better instinct that says, I've got a 50% chance of getting divorced. She's going to take half my income if she's not already making more than me. And then I'm, not, and I'm only going to see my kids on the weekend. That doomerist mindset is already very common amongst millennials and Gen Z. And overcoming that's a lot harder when there isn't even the ability to ignore cynicism because nobody looks at love in that romanticized way anymore. Mm -hmm. and, I think that a lot of women are also into this doomerist black pill. Yeah mindset about marriage too because and, they're like well i'm gonna i'm gonna have kids and uh, one day my beauty is going to fade and then if i'm only valued for my looks then i'm i'm bound to be abandoned by a man because the internet is telling them that's the most important thing about themselves right is their you, looks. you apparently hit the wall at age 30 because i mean you can't you simply can't look good after age 30. what that's stupid right like so if, if your appearance if you're being told i guess or yeah. conditioned to believe your appearance is the only thing that you have to offer in a relationship then what is so appealing about the idea of being in a relationship then if it's not lifelong so i think there are some black pills all around it's kind of like it's it's, it's like just dating to pass the time as opposed to dating to or to not to, be alone to, yeah, yeah which a yeah. lot of people it's actually been like being in a relationship has been easier for me now because i spent a long time being comfortable with being alone and then when you actually find someone that you enjoy being with, that means that I don't have that innate fear of, of being alone. So when you actually meet somebody that you want to be with and you want to spend time with, it's not not necessarily like what I'd tell life-changing, but it kind of is mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. And a lot of that has to come from a certain amount of emotional maturity and life experience that you can't really... like. You got married young, very young, right? Yeah. Very young. So for me, I don't think that would have been possible for me because I just, I wasn't wired that way, yeah. right? But for me, the life experience I've gained since then and all of the things that I've had to overcome and change about myself means that I wouldn't have been ready for a long-term relationship or, or a super, you know, heavily committed relationship until I had gotten through all that stuff. The yeah. problem is it's getting through the cynicism and the and the lack of, uh, of connection that people are feeling today. And that's on top of, you know, technology making making people more distant than they've ever been from other people. You can be in a room of people and not actually feel like you're uh, connecting with anyone. So uh, I, I feel like this, the narcissism and the, the kind of constant desire to self-obsess for Gen Z plays a mm -hmm. huge role. Like you were saying earlier, you said you're online less than you've ever been lately. I've been trying to. No. Sometimes I feel like it ebbs and flows every other mm -hmm. week where it's I get back into being online and then I have to take a break and then I get back into being online and then I have to take a break. Mm -hmm. But I can say that, I mean, when I was, before I was married, when I was just dating my husband, my now husband, um, we actually didn't use any social media for the longest period of time. Mm -hmm. And my goodness, that was so nice being tapped out completely. And I, I mean, nowadays it's just unrealistic for me because of what I do for work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I wish I could, like I do. <laughs> like, like when we're sitting here and like me and Mary are, we have to send each other like stuff on Twitter back and forth to talk about. <laughs> and I'm just like, I wish I could throw this thing in a molten like thing of lava. Yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get it. Um, I want to decipher the situationship. Sure. The situationship is the term for dating without the label, I guess. And they interview this girl 
named Lindsay King, a 24 year old who told me that she's in a situation ship right now. She defines it as dating with everything but the label. I asked her how it's going and she said, when I think about it, it's frustrating. When I don't think about it, I'm like, oh, this is fun and no pressure. She had been talking with this guy uh, since February. They'd had a few breaks during which she dated a few other people. And she said, um, basically, you know, I, I, I think this is like a, I, I think a situationship is either being enforced as a situationship from one side or the other. Yeah. Both people wouldn't agree to that. So usually the way I interpret it is that the woman is pretending that she's okay with it but isn't and wants commitment. Right. And the guy is the one who wants to keep his options open. Although nowadays I wouldn't be so surprised if the roles were shifted between the two sexes yeah, and that the guy be. actually secretly wants Women are supposed to have a roster. A According roster. to Call Her Daddy, Call Her Daddy is literally the podcast that told women yep. to keep a roster. They yeah. are the ones who coined the term. One I think. to buy you dinner, and another one to pay for your car payment, and another one to do this. And as awful as that behavior is, those dudes are embarrassing. Those dudes are pathetic for being willing to do that. Uh, that is assuming they know. I'm just okay. saying. They might not know. No matter know. if they do, that's even worse. That means she's a sociopath. I think no matter what the situation is. If there's a situation ship going on, one person does not want it to be a situation ship. And why can't why can't we just call it friends with benefits anymore? Why do we have to give it this kitschy new name that mm. makes people feel like they're doing something that's a little bit less harmless than just hooking up there's with a friend? It's, it's years, hooking up with a friend. There's 30 years of television that talks about this. And I, one of the things that I point out all the time, we talk about this all the time, 30 years of television showing women as more sexually promiscuous and more sexually aggressive than they are in the real world outside mm -hmm. of clubs and stuff like that where it's it's uh and you could even make the argument and a lot of people might not like it that this is the male fantasy that this is a female written from the point of a male who wishes that the women in his life had been that sexually aggressive or that sexually forward mm -hmm. because they themselves weren't um you know uh, assertive enough to be the dominant in a situation mm. so they always wished they had seen they'd been able to be around women that were like that mm -hmm. we got right? a 20 dollar from crispy like transport llc that's called regular dating mm. if this is regular dating that's not a good sign i think that it actually goes deeper the situation ship actually goes deeper than friends with benefits mm. i think because they're talking about doing everything that couples do couples mm. with a label do mm -hmm. they go on dates and they hang out uh, all, all the time they facetime each other constantly and they're messaging each other constantly and they actually do behave as if they're in a relationship with a label but refuse to label it and there was a great video when the non-committal from... one is kind of packed into a corner about like what is this yeah they're like oh you know like we're just having fun <laughs> and the the sad thing is is that there's a power in like just being like a, a, enough of an adult of a man to be like I want to put a label on this oh yeah and be like and, and it's just that a lot of people are too scared to it's, it's sad right you think that your brain is smart enough to interpret if we're willing to go this far if we're willing to do this she should be willing to do this and if she says no that's not something that you should be embarrassed about you did everything right up until you refused to actually put a label on this situation but that takes a certain level of courage that i actually don't think it should like if you're if you're already spending all your time together if you're already having sex if you're already um doing all these things together then asking that is not, it's not i mean much some people <laughs> even have kids and they right. can't fathom the idea of committing to each other so even is, though um, having kids in itself is a commitment there was a the content machines just funny literally released this video the other day called day in the life of platonic friends oh no Platonic besties first thing we do is wake up from our sleepover then we pick out each other's outfits we're twinning then we go for a walk and i see a really scary guy so i protect chloe i love making her feel safe then we go out to lunch and Tyler pours my water for me. So I give him a bite of my burrito. He's so messy. Then Chloe the talks to me. The problem is that this is the type of thing that actually happens in the <laughs> yeah. world now. Yeah, um, another one that was listed outside of the article, uh, one of the takes I saw about this, about why men uh, in Gen Z are hesitant to commit or to date in general. 
They said, I don't think people understand just how messed up Zoomers were by the culture war. An entire generation reaching the learn how to talk to girls stage at the exact same time as Me Too and the campus rape crisis. Right. It's a big part of why younger people aren't dating. So is there really truly a sentiment among Gen Z men that they think if they go up to a girl and say, you know, hello, nice to meet you, come here often, whatever, that they're going to get a rape allegation? Is this a really, like, actually palpable sentiment among Zoomer men? I've heard like, this from several Zoomer and men. Is it all in their heads? Or is it I really would, I an would actual like risk? To tell you, I would like to tell you that, yes, this is a, a figment of their imagination that's spurred on by, like, articles they're reading that are designed to scare the crap out of them. But I have the story that I've always told you. The Like, randomly on a college campus a decade ago, and I hold the door open for a woman, and she <laughs> yells at me. And that's from somebody who was just visiting, did not go to college there, was there visiting to see a friend yeah. and had this feminist, go like just stuff just spewed back at me on a random day, mm -hmm. right? If that happens to me randomly, you're telling me it didn't happen to the guys who actually went to that school? I mean, I had a good friend who had false Title IX allegations leveraged against him mm -hmm. um, and it almost threatened his entire college graduation. And so it's like, a, it is a very real threat when you can leverage your sexual power over men as a woman. Like that is a very real threat. Especially when, especially when they've been raised to believe that they have been oppressed and yes. that's their one weapon against them. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye guys.